All right, class. Well, welcome to the last part of this set of three lectures. Uh, this is part B of uh, lecture 14, I believe. Uh, in uh, Well, actually, we had a part B, uh, so we broke part A down into two parts. So technically, I guess it's part C. It's listed as part C, but really we're breaking this lecture down into two parts. Part A, the first one through 16 slides, which are unstructured uncertainty. And in this uh, set of slides, we'll consider the case of structured uncertainty. Right, so we should add a D there, structured. Norm bounded uncertainty in particular. In lecture 13, we could of course considered interval and polytopic uncertainty with sort of an additive structure. And in this case, uh, in this lecture 14, we considered the LFT. And so draw an LFT here. Delta, which allows us to consider more general classes of uh, uncertainty. And in particular, we can do a polytopic uncertainty here, but we're going to focus on the, uh, the case of norm-bounded uncertainty. So we've got norm-bounded uncertainty here. And in particular, we'll consider uh, the case of structured uncertainty. So if you remember lecture 12, uh, when we sort of derived these LFT representations uh, for several cases, all of the cases that we derived had this structured uncertainty uh, form. Right? So uh, if we looked at, broke down this, uh, this delta block, what it uh, represented, if you recall, there was like a delta m for our mass variability, there was a delta c for our damper variability, and there was a delta k for our uh, spring variability. Right? So and everything off diagonal was zero. Right? So that was our uncertainty, and clearly this has a structure to it, right? So all of these, there are a lot of zeros here. And if we uh, just do the unstructured uncertainty case, we're going to get pretty conservative results because the unstructured results that we had on the part A of this lecture um, will, will allow for terms in here, right? Delta M, C, so cross terms right there. But in reality, uh, those are those are relatively rare, and hence we are left with the, un the structured uncertainty case. So the question is, can we extend the results without losing too much, or introducing too much conservatism? Can we extend the results from part A to the this structured case? Um, so the answer is partially, and uh, unfortunately. We're, we'll start off with the, with the best results and then we'll sort of go downhill a little bit, unfortunately, uh, in that uh, the structured uncertainty case, optimal control with structured uncertainty is still an NP hard problem, right? Uh, so this is, uh, we're not going to get perfect results. Um, so we'll start off, we'll get some pretty good results, at least for the full state feedback case. And then we'll see as we, if when we consider uh, DK iteration and mu synthesis at the end, uh, we're gonna just have to throw some heuristics at the problem and, and hope that it works okay. All right. So, uh, but I don't want to I don't want to be a downer so so soon into the into the lecture slides. So let's uh, let's not focus on the negative, but focus on the positive. What can we do in this case? So uh, here's our general framework uh, we've got here. As we see in this sort of, this is the mass spring case, mass spring case that we considered in, uh, uh, sorry, you're off the screen. This is the mass spring case, which we considered in lecture 12. Uh, we can see that uh, the, uh, the, di the, the diagonals here, right, these blocks are all scalars. And uh, there, there's nothing much more to it than that, right? There's no I matrix, there's just simple scalars. But occasionally uh, we get more complex forms of uncertainty, and so we'll have this, uh, we'll consider this more general case here, where we've got uh, these scalars, so this would be like delta M, and this would be uh, delta K, for example, here. Um, but we also allow them to enter through multiple channels, right? So. Uh, we have this identity matrix. So if, if the, the delta M appears in a couple places, uh, we could, uh, ideally we would just, we would isolate that through a single channel, but I suppose in certain cases uh, you want 
it affects multiple channels. Although that's not a great representation. It's best if you can not have these uh, matrices, these identity matrices here, but we do. Anyway, it is a general case. So if you fail at that, uh, then uh, you have those identity matrices here. So these mat identity matrices uh, give rise to something like that, delta M, delta M, delta M, right? That kind of block. Uh, likewise, right, for all the other blocks as well, right? But you can vary the size of these blocks by you know, changing your, uh, the dimension here. So it's uh, just the most general case right, that we're going to consider here. Uh, likewise, uh, so we may have cases where we have unstructured uncertainty blocks that pop in here as well. And those are going to be, those are the deltas. So those are the, lar the capital deltas. So these are our matrix valued and they're unstructured. They're unstructured in each block is unstructured. The whole thing is still structured in sort of this diagonal form, but uh, we, can, we can allow for certain unstructured blocks to pop in. So we've got uh, some scalars here on the diagonal. Mostly there'll just be scalars. And here we've got some, uh, some unstructured blocks, which we also include in a diagonal manner. Right. So this is uh, the most sort of diagonal uncertainty. Uh, of course, you might have something like, you might have another delta over here, right? The same delta S plus one or something like that. Um, but uh, really that's, uh, we can't, there's not much we can do with that. So let's like, we're, we're going to ignore that case for, for the moment and assume, well, actually for the whole lecture. Uh, so we'll, we'll just assume everything off diagonal is zero. So these are all zeros, okay. lots of zeros. And of course, below the diagonal is zeros too. Zero, just add a little bunch of zeros here. They don't line up, so sorry about that. Uh, but uh, you can see here that this is a rather particular form, diagonally structured, uh, more general form of structured uncertainty. There are results, but they're much more complex, and uh, it, there's a whole fauna of that. And we're, we're just not going to delve into it. It's too deep a dive, so we're going to stick with this. So I'm going to start actually by introducing uh, actually what is rather a complex uh, concept, which is the idea of a structured singular value. So the structured singular value can't do a course on robust control without talking about the structured singular value because it has, uh, everyone knows what it is. Well, at least everyone thinks they knows what it is. Everyone's heard of it at least, right? The structured singular value. So we have to, we're going to start by introducing what the structural singular value is. And then we'll use it to motivate the, uh, the concepts of scalings in the next slide. So um, actually, the structured singular value is a little bit hard to understand. Um, so let's, uh, let's write out our, uh, our LFT here a little bit. Right. There's uh, M and there's delta. We've got a channel going up to delta, back to M. And at this point, let's not have these uh, exogenous inputs and outputs. Let's, let's, let's leave those alone for a moment. Okay. Uh, although, right, I have four M, M blocks, so I guess we should include them. All right, they're going in like that. <clears throat> so, um, okay, so what is the structure of singular value? Um, so the structured singular value is basically the, uh, the smallest gain bound you can put, or the I should say, the largest gain bound you can put on delta, such that the interconnection here is stable, right? Well, actually it's the one over that, so the, the, the smallest bound you can put on M, the smallest gain you can put on M, such that it retains stability in, uh, in, 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 in the closed loop, right? So, um, okay, so let's, let's parse this a little bit. So here's the definition. That's the definition. The definition is the structured singular value of an M, and this is known, right? Assume it's known. Uh, delta is a set, right? A set, also known. We know what the set is. In this case, we'll mostly be concerned with norm bounded uncertainty, but this structured singular value applies to any uncertainty set. So I'll just say it's any set, but... Uh, norm bounded for us. Although that norm bound doesn't, we don't, we don't need to, to worry about that in this, in this particular uh, set of slides. Um, but uh, so let's, let's, let's actually just erase that. 
Right. So, okay, what are we going to say? Um, so the, uh, if we parse this, uh, this little notation, the structured singular value is 1 over, and that's a little bit complicated by itself, uh, 1 over the smallest delta in the uncertainty set. So the size of the smallest delta in the uncertainty set, which destabilizes the, the system. Right? So if we m here is just this m11, right? that's m, that's what goes in there. Right? So if we find the uh, upper star product, right, s bar of m comma delta, right, remember it's got, uh, it has that form m22 uh, plus m21, and the, the important here is i minus m11 delta inverse m12. I think that's right, um, although don't quote me on it. Uh, check another slide just to make sure. In any case, right, uh, so the, the, this closed loop, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, lower upper star product is stable, right, if this parameter here is uh, in H infinity, if it's, if it's stable, right? Uh, so it's, it's stable if uh, it's not singular, if you can invert it. Um, so uh, we're finding, if we just parse this a little bit more, we're finding the smallest delta such that uh, the closed loop or the fractional transformation is stable. Smallest delta in that uncertainty set uh, that uh, destabilizes the system. Right. right. So 1 over the smallest value of delta which destabilizes the system. Right. Okay. So, uh, okay, that's an interesting definition. Uh, what does it tell us, right? So, for specifically, we typically, like, take delta to be norm-bounded to begin with, right? So we often, like, say delta is less than 1. So what does that tell us, right? So if uh, that, what that tells us, then if we say, if we assume the delta is less than 1, uh, actually... What it tells us is that if we look at this term i minus m delta, right, and uh, if we're looking for the smallest delta, well, we can the, we have some ambiguity in where the scaling factor is is located, right? So uh, if we say multiply uh, delta by alpha, right, that's equivalent to i minus alpha m, right? So you can think of this actually as the uh, smallest gain, uh, the, well, actually, the, the largest gain f factor by which you can increase m before you destabilize the system with a unit norm bound on the uncertainty. Okay, so, all right. Um, all right, so no one, like, likes this definition very much because it's a little bit confusing. Let's focus on one case, right? Uh, so, um, right, if, uh, if uh, uh, we consider the case of unstructured uncertainty, right, unstructured dynamic uncertainty, right, then uh, the structured singular value is just the uh, uh, so with uh, unit norm, then the structured uncertainty, uh, the structured singular value, sorry, is simply the norm on M, right? So that's how large you can make M before you destabilize the system, right? So if we remember the uh, um, right? uh, small gain theorem, for example, right? We remember that. Uh, if delta is less than 1 and m is less than 1, uh, then the, the closed-loop system is stable, right? Small gain. Now, we've shown in, the, in part A that actually small gain is necessary and sufficient when um, uh, the set necessary and sufficient for uh, stability in, in the case of unstructured uncertainty. So then 
what happens when we have structured uncertainty. Well, it says that the small gain is actually a little bit conservative in this case. It says that if you, um, uh, if you have structured uncertainty, then you can actually increase the gain on, um, on M up to this structured singular value. Uh, and retain stability, right? So small gain uh, transforms itself into uh, the structured singular value. So the smallest gain you can put on M but before you, you lose, close, lose stability for some delta in that, that, feed, that, that uncertainty set. Okay. And so, uh, you know, you could, right, this is, this is just, right, uh, a restatement here of uh, this little trick here, right? Sorry, I forgot left over that. Right, so uh, it says that, right, uh, you can uh, take this alpha, right, alpha m, and put it in the, bring it out of that uh, structured singular value, and, uh, and, and you get uh, closed loop stability. Right? So you can increase m by a factor of 1 over mu before you lose uh, stability in closed loop for some. A particular value of that uncertainty set. Okay. So obviously if uh, m, if we're just applying a small gain theorem, right, then um, then, right, uh, then if, if m, if we have the, an h infinity bound on m, right, then the structured singular value is just, um, like the maximum delta you can, you can you can increase uh, delta by uh, the, the is, is just 1 over m. Oh, I think, uh, sorry, I'm like going off, going off there, my bad. Um, so, okay. So, uh, right. So if the h infinity norm of, uh, of m is h in, is, is that, Right, we know by the small gain theorem, we know that uh, the closed loop is stable for all deltas less than one over m, right? Because you take the product of uh, delta and 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 m, and uh, that implies that the product m times the product of delta is less than right m divided by m which is less than or equal to one, right? So in the, uh, in the, uh, in the case of unstructured uncertainty and just, just applying the small gain theorem, right? Uh, then uh, the maximum size of delta, which destabilizes this, or wait, so the minimum size of delta, which destabilizes the system is just one over M. Um, and so in the unstructured case, right? The structured singular value is just one over this, because remember we have a one over here term. And so it's, we just recover M, right? In all cases, of course, right, just by the small gain, we know that the structured singular value is less than M. And then in the particular case where the uncertainty is unstructured, the, the structured singular value is M, right? So um, again, it's a little bit confusing because, right, uh, we've got uh, this one over term and we've got uh, 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 we're, we're taking uh, finding a bound on delta, right? But uh, the, that's 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 how the st structured singular value is uh, is thought of. And um, uh, so, what we can what can we do with this, right? Well, first of all, of course, right? We can impose a condition on M. Uh, we can use it to impose a condition on M for which we obtain uh, closed loop stability. Um, and moreover, right, if we can somehow optimize M uh, to maximize the structured singular value, well, then that increases the robustness properties of M, and that's the whole process of a mu synthesis. Okay. Uh, again, uh, we're not going to cover mu synthesis uh, in too much depth here. <clears throat> uh, we will note that, however, uh, just to start off with the bad news, right, computing the structured singular value is NP hard, right? So in general, and even in the case of diagonal uncertainty, uh, this is an NP hard problem. 
Right? Unless, of course, it's unstructured in the case where we, we already know it's, it's necessary, small gain is necessary and sufficient. Right? So uh, uh, that, uh, that seems like bad news, but uh, where, what, 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 can we, what can we say? So that, let's, we start off with bad news. There's the bad news. What's the good news? Well, the good news is that uh, finding the structured singular value is actually phrasable in a way which is sort of computable, which is it can at least be posed as an optimization problem. Right. Uh, so let's uh, let's think about this a little bit. Right. So here's our LFT again. We've got our delta. We got our M. We got our delta. And there's a feedback interconnection right there. Right. Um, so let's let's think about this. Um, so if this thing is a representation of our our system, right? Then we have this concept of scalings, which says that there's a lot of equivalent representations of the system. So anytime we have this system, we can throw in a uh, a theta and a theta inverse for any theta, right? This works for any theta, right? That it's invertible, of course. Uh, and we get an equivalent, right, representation. Right. Now, actually, I should, I'm going to put the data inverse there on the other, that's the other side. Now, the interesting bit is, uh, if theta commutes with delta, that is, if uh, theta delta equals delta theta, so that applying um, the, uh, the theta first and then the delta is equal to applying the delta and then the theta, well, then we can move this, uh, this one little block here to the other side of delta. So we can get m delta theta inverse. And then we move theta to the other side of delta, and we get, again, an equivalent representation. If theta delta equals delta theta. So if delta commutes with theta. Well, OK, that's an equivalent representation. And then, of course, if this closed loop interconnection is stable if and only if, right? Uh, the interconnection of delta and uh, theta m theta inverse is stable, right? Right. Remember, this is just uh, uh, actually sorry, wrong side. Right. Um, actually, it's the other way around. Okay. Well, we can replace uh, in in this condition. I replaced theta with theta inverse, but that's okay. So. This interconnection is stable if and only if for a given theta, this interconnection is stable, right? So does that help us? Well, it gives us a little bit more flexibility because we, we can now search over thetas which are, which, uh, for which, which prove that this interconnection is stable. Um, and then actually the, the, the very impressive result, the very uh, in, interesting result, is that this is actually necessary and sufficient for stability. Right? That the system is, the closed-up interconnection is stable if and only if there exists a theta which commutes with delta such that, right, uh, this new system, right, where I've swapped my thetas and theta inverse, so I apologize for that, uh, if that new system is also stable under the interconnection of delta. Uh, so, of course, if theta equals, right, um, if theta equals identity, right, we just have the, uh, the norm of M uh, less than uh, 1, right, and we recover small gain. Right. So, if uh, theta is equal to identity, right, we, we're recovering the small gain condition, right. Uh, but of course, that's necessary and sufficient for unstructured uncertainties. 
but now what this says is that the small gain condition with a theta is necessary and sufficient for stability, right? So if we can somehow search over the set of all such scalings, well, that's going to give us a necessary and sufficient condition for structured uh, st stability of structured uncertainty. And here we, we phrase it as this, as this uh, structured singular value, uh, which of course is always confusing, but that's okay. Um, and so the question then we're, we're going to pose in the next uh, few slides, the uh, next, uh, what is it, nine slides, eight slides, is how to do that, right? Right? How to search over the set of scalings Um, and then, while at the same time, right, enforcing this uh, this closed loop stability. And so, when the the most of the results, at least in the first part of this lecture or this part B, are going to be generalizations of the unstructured case, uh, where we replace the um, we replace that uh, that uh, S procedure with a scaling version of S procedures. So if we can search over the set of scalings, we can get a scaled version of the S procedure. And so that's more what we're going to be focusing on uh, for the next few slides. So first of all, of course, what we need to do is uh, figure out what set of uh, scalings, what set of factors uh, commute with our set of uncertainties. So recall this is our set of uncertainties. We can write it out in its uh, block diagonal form, right? Delta 1, delta 2, and then maybe we've got a delta here. All right, so these are scalars, and this is a, um, a matrix block. All right. So uh, what, what set of matrices uh, commute with this matrix, right? So, okay, what? Let's think about that. Um, so basically, uh, okay, let's start with uh, with just uh, delta one times identity. What set of matrices commute with delta one with the identity matrix, right? Because it's just a scalar with the multiplied by the identity matrix, and everything commutes with a scalar. I suppose I should write that down. Everything commutes with scalars. All right, so uh, alpha times m equals m alpha for any matrix, right? And of course, if you put an identity in front of that, it changes nothing. Right? So okay, uh, f so with so if we just had a block like that with the identity matrix, right? Everything would commute with it, right? So no, that that's pretty easy. Um, okay, uh, what, uh, what, 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 so that, that's one, one thing we can do. Um, what else? Uh, so what about the delta block? What commutes with matrices? So if we know nothing about delta, well, what commutes with matrices? Well, I just said that scalars commute with matrices. Uh, and in fact, scalar times their identity commutes with a matrix. So let me call that theta i equals delta theta i. Right. So everything commute, uh, scalars commute with matrices. And I just said that. Of course, uh, if we don't know anything about delta, that's pretty much all we can say about uh, this matrix delta, that scalars commute with it, and there's nothing else that we can guarantee that will commute with it because we don't know any other additional properties of it. Right? So, okay, well, we know how to, we know what commutes with this, we know what commutes with that, we know what commutes with that. Uh, so, right, obviously, if we've got uh, things which commute with each of these blocks, right, uh, anything that commutes with uh, each of those blocks, well, we can put it in uh, sort of a, uh, a structured case, right, so we can get um, M, m and uh, theta i, right? 
So m commutes with delta, m commutes with delta, and maybe I should make this n. n commutes with delta, and so we get that right, delta, delta, 1, 2, 1, 2, delta, equal, or uh, times, sorry, typo there, uh, m, n, theta, i. So for every scalar block, we can introduce a, uh, a matrix scaling, right? So uh, for this I, uh, scalar block commutes with this matrix, this scalar block commute, uh, commutes with that matrix. Now for the unstructured block, we have scalars, right? This is a scalar. Uh, and this is a matrix. We don't know anything about the matrix. It could be anything. Anything commutes with uh, that scalar. Uh, and this, uh, these, of course, are scalars as well. All right. So for each uh, unstructured block, we can parameterize the set of scalings using scalars. And for every scalar block, we can, be, can, be, uh, we can um, parameterize the set of commuting matrices with matrices. Right. So that's... Uh, uh, these, this is a sort of a set of um, a set of uh, of uh, of uh, um, uh, parameters which uh, commute with this set of uncertainty sets. Now we're going to add a little bit of an extra parameter here. We're going to, or a little bit of a constraint, um, which is that uh, actually maybe this is a typo. We should get rid of. That. Uh, we're going to add an additional constraint referring to um, P, which is uh, that these parameters be positive. Uh, why do we uh, make them positive? Well, there's a couple reasons. A, we can uh, without, without conservatism. And B, uh, because uh, you, it makes it, you, can take the in, you know you can take the inverse of positive matrices. So there's, there's that. Um, so the P refers to positive, right? And theta just refers to the set of scalings. Right? So here we had like just set of scalings, and here we have the positive scalings, right? So we have this uh, very nice result here, which says that um, the uh, 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 there exists a scaling such that the uh, this this is remember where we get the structured singular value uh, that bounds the structured singular value, if and only if there exists a positive scaling uh, and a, a, a positive matrix now because we're in state space, uh, such that right uh, here is our sort of standard Lyapunov inequality, and uh, here is the the scaling right there and the scaling is right there. Notice that this is identical to the LMI we had for um, uh, quadratic stability uh, using the S procedure. Except that we've replaced uh, what we had before, which was uh, mu and mu i with uh, the scalings um, uh, theta and, and theta. And remember, of course, right, we said that if the block is unstructured, right, the only thing that commutes with it is uh, just a scalar. And so in the unstructured case, that's where we got these scalars, uh, scalings, scalar scalings. Uh, however, in the diagonal case, more things commute with, with these matrices. And so we can, uh, we can, Add these uh, uh, these parameters here. Uh, we can add, add add some flexibility to our parameter set, right? uh, specifically looking at the positive scalings. Right. Um, so this, uh, as I said, right, this allows us to uh, generalize the S procedure to uh, the case of structured uncertainty. Um, it's a it's an LMI, right? Uh, so Right, it's an LMI because right this uh, theta is, is a variable now, uh, and it's a variable in a set 
uh, the, uh, of matrices that we can parameterize, right? So it's, it's, it's easy to parameterize, right? We create, make this our variable one, this our variable all the way out to S. Uh, so we have matrix variables here, we have scalar variables here, but it's all, right, theta is linear in all of those variables, right? So uh, this, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're typing this into, into YOMIP, right, for example, right, you would uh, create a, um, a, a matrix variable, or actually an SDP var, you make it, making these scalars positive, right? Um, so make a, a SDP var for theta one, uh, all the way out to uh, theta s, and, uh, and those are matrices, so uh, n by n. And then you make scalar SDP vars. Uh, with dimension one, right, for these scalars. And then you construct your larger uh, variable theta by concatenating these here in the block diagonal structure. So you, you make theta one, theta two, theta n. Or actually, we should add those deltas there, delta i. Okay. So declare your individual uh, variables here, right? Those are your individual variables and then just formulate uh, the larger variable theta, and then use theta, that big theta, in your SDP constraint. And so now here our variables are P, right, P, 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 and theta, 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 theta. And so obviously this LMI is linear in theta and in P, and so we can solve it, it's an LMI. It's an LMI for uh, stability of uh, structured uncertainties. So how do, we, uh, how do we prove this, right, to prove the, the theorem, right? Uh, so what we do is, uh, let's see, where's my uh, limits here? Right. Right, there we go. Uh, so remember, we, how do we do this? Well, we've got here uh, our system, M. Uh, which is given by this set of dynamics here. Okay. And the output of that is P, which goes into delta and comes out as Q and goes back into the system. Now, so what we're going to do is do exactly what I said on the previous slide. We're going to uh, plug in here uh, for the output, right? We're going to make uh, that T, so we're going to have this uh, transformation T, T inverse here, which is, that's composed that, it's just the identity. May, this is just, you, you know, you can add that anywhere you like. And then uh, because uh, T uh, commutes with delta, uh, uh, T inverse also commutes with delta, so we're going to get to move this to the other side. Right. And so we uh, redefine now P as this thing here, and Q is this thing here, and move this T inverse over to the system itself. So now uh, the output of the system, right, this is an equivalent representation because we've just added T, T inverse here. Um, this is an equivalent representation where we multiply the, of the, the output of the original system by this T matrix here and of course T there. And then uh, we're multiplying the input from our original Q by T inverse, right? So, right, that's our new Q, and that's our new Q here, right? So this is an equivalent representation of the same set of uncertainties, right? Where for, and this works for any T in the, uh, in the set of scalings, set of, set of thetas which commute with delta. So, okay, um, so this is an equivalent system. So obviously its stability is equivalent to the uh, stability of the original system, right? So now let's just write down the uh, small gain condition, right, for, uh, for stability. Uh, this is where the, the S, like the S procedure, just with the, this, the tau equal one, right? This is the S procedure. 
with tau equal one. So uh, then we get this uh, this condition for right uh, for stability uh, for quadratic stability. Uh, not necessary and sufficient at this point because uh, because um, uh, right uh, we uh, we've used tau equal one. Um, but now we have an entirely uh, a whole new class of uh, stability conditions where we're replacing these uh, the um, n with with tau n right so that come so that becomes that that becomes that uh, m becomes m t inverse right m becomes m t inverse m becomes m t inverse q becomes t uh, Q T inverse, right? Right. It's transposed here, so the T appears on the other side. Uh, and then uh, Q becomes T Q T inverse, uh, and Q becomes T Q T inverse transpose, and M becomes right that, and there that becomes that. Okay, so a lot of little arrows going everywhere. So uh, what do we see here now? So the, the so this uh, the stability condition is equivalent to that stability condition for any t. Right. Now we do one more transformation. So uh, because uh, now because we've we've taken uh, a, a t to be um, uh, invertible, right? We can multiply this LMI on the left and the right by here on the left by i t inverse zero zero and on the right by i zero zero t inverse transpose right and uh, now this uh, this t inverse cancels that term uh, cancels that term uh, this t inverse cancels that term cancels that term right there and uh, of course this term disappears, this term also disappears. And so what we're left with, right, is an equivalent LMI, which only has T inverse squared there and T inverse squared there. Although I shouldn't, I should say this is actually, uh, note that's uh, uh, T inverse, um, T inverse transpose, let's see. Right. So, what this shows, right, uh, is that any scaling, right, uh, stability uh, under arbitrary scaling, right, quadratic stability at arbitrary scaling becomes equivalent to uh, stability under positive scaling because T inverse squared here uh, is a positive matrix. So if there exists a scaling uh, which proves uh, stability, um, then there also exists a positive scaling which proves stability, right? So we can limit ourselves to positive scalings. Okay. Uh, and this, uh, it's nice because now this positive scaling appears linearly in the, the LMI here, right? So we've, uh, we've, we've shown, right, we started out here, right, that uh, the structured singular value is equivalent to the set of uh, scalings, right? In uh, uh, stability under the set of scalings, uh, we've shown that stability under the set of scalings is now equivalent to stability under the set of positive scalings, right? And we can uh, enforce now um, this uh, the set of positive scalings using an LMI condition. Right? So what? Uh, so that's uh, that shows that the set the the question of of, of uh, quadratic stability can be expressed for structured uncertainty as an LMI uh, with positivity constraints on our scalings. Right. That positivity constraint there. Um, what else does it show? Right. So that's uh, that's uh, that's equivalent. Of course, we haven't really shown that the uh, the our set our proposed set of scalings are that diagonal structure is necessary and sufficient. So there's uh, there's a little if statement here. We've, we've lost the if and only if. 
but uh, but that's okay. So now we can apply this to uh, quadratic stabilization, right? Stabilization under structured uncertainty, right? I should really make that a little S, right? Structured uncertainty. Um, so basically using the same variable substitution trick that we've used many times, this is, a, by the way, identical, of course, to the stabilization condition uh, using the S procedure, except, of course, now we, uh, we allow a more general set of scalings, right? So if we made this uh, theta equals mu i, right, that recovers the uh, S procedure. So um, there we go. That's uh, that's uh, that's pretty much it in terms of uh, an LMI for uh, stabilizing state feedback control with uh, structured norm bounded uncertainty. So stabilization uh, under structured norm bounded uncertainty can be expressed as an LMI. Uh, it's efficiency here, uh, we don't have necessity, we lost that through our parameterization of scalings, but, uh, but here it is. Okay. We can of course extend this to optimal control by simply taking the S procedure LMI for optimal control and replacing that mu i with uh, scalings, right, uh, with this different uh, un, uh, LMI constraint linear constraint, linear uh, LMI constraint. Uh, incidentally, I should note that uh, uh, actually this entire lecture is more or less taken from uh, Boyd's book. Of course, it's hard to find LMIs uh, for robust control, at least at the basic level, which are not in, in Boyd's book. So if you want to to follow along, right, you can translate through from Boyd's book. Although Boyd doesn't actually, in many cases, doesn't actually uh, uh, pose this, uh, you know, the, formulate the actual scalings uh, <laughs> because he says they're obvious. But, uh, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of Boyd and he just makes everything seem obvious. So, uh, um, but, uh, but there we are. And it is in a way, right? Uh, you know the way it's explained, right? It's it's relatively straightforward, relatively natural. There's not much theoretical content to it, right? You're just parameterizing the set of uh, uh, matrices which commute with your uncertainty set, and then optimizing over those. Although there is that trick, right? There is that trick uh, here where we're uh, uh, replacing the uh, uh, this uh, we, we linearize this by getting rid of these these t's and making this a positive uh, a positive new new variable variable this is a variable substitution um, okay so again right uh, in this case we're going to set q equal to zero. Um, so we're, we're gonna we're gonna miss that that Q term here. I think it showed up here. Right. Uh, so we're gonna we'll scratch that off. Right. Uh, so, but if we do that, right? Oh, and again, right? I should have corrected this here. Um, so W. That's C and W. Uh, so uh, again, we have an LMI for H infinity optimal control, right? Um, H infinity optimal control, where it's not really H infinity optimal control. It's uh, it, we're we're optimizing a uh, L two gain bound, right? Because H infinity doesn't actually mean anything in the case of uh, time varying systems, right? So uh, we we're, we're actually doing, but we interpret it as H infinity. I, we mentioned that earlier, so we don't need to discuss it. Uh, so again, right? Here we are, we're just taking the, uh, that scalar condition that we had before, right, where this was uh, before mu i, this was mu i, uh, which we got from the S procedure, and we're replacing it by, with the, uh, the set of positive scalings here, um, 
which uh, again is uh, is done in the same way we did on two slides ago, um, and uh, is the, there's not much more to say about it, I guess. So um, again, right? If Q is zero, all these terms drops out. That's why we don't we only see the scaling showing up twice there, here and here, right? In the one one and two two blocks. So it only shows up twice, one one and two two blocks. And then we add this uh, H-infinity optimal control um, parameter here from the KYP lemma. Yep. Uh, right, so you solve, anyway, you solve this LMI and you get a, um, uh, a controller which achieves uh, the, this minimized bound gamma uh, under the set of structured uncertainties. And presumably this, uh, because of the flexibility in this theta, uh, you, uh, you're gonna get a better value than you did or a smaller value than you did uh, in the case of unstructured uncertainty. Right, right um, again, right, how does it work? Uh, it's, it's the same deal as before, right? We uh, now have an additional channel, right? Uh, but we're adding this uh, t here to the delta, adding that t inverse here, right there, uh, and it of course only affects the uh, the cha the uncertain channels, right? It shows up there, it shows up there, it shows up there, um, and of course it doesn't show up here because we eliminated the q term, right? So, uh, and then uh, we uh, we do that same variable transform pre and post multiplying by t i i t and of course i i t uh, transpose on the other side and uh, we get that same uh, t uh, inverse squared which is of course t inverse t inverse transposed right? uh, we make the, do a variable substitution and we make that theta it has the same structure as theta as before, and moreover, it's positive because it's a square. And of course, any square, right, you can take a square root and recover the scaling if you like. Okay. And we'll actually show that we need to recover that scaling uh, on, the, on the final slide when we do DK iteration. Uh, this one actually didn't uh, appear in Boyd per se, but, um, but it's, it's obvious from, from Boyd's um, approach. So basically, and we, th this has all been good news, right? Right. Uh, we can more or less solve the H infinity optimal control under structured uncertainty, uh, assuming, and this is key, uh, state feedback. Right. So that means, of course, U equals K X. Now, obviously, we would like to do this with, uh, with uh, not state feedback, with uh, dynamic output feedback, as we did in the case of H infinity optimal control without robustness. Unfortunately, that's harder, right? And this is where the bad news starts popping in. How to solve the output feedback problem. And of course, that's, uh, that's more, more important because, right, we want generally our k not to be state feedback because we can't usually measure all our states, right? Um, so how to formulate this problem? Well, okay, so this is where the upper and lower star product come in. Uh, so basically we have a G, which is now a uh, nine matrix. Wait, am I thinking one, two, three, four, five, six? Uh, no, actually 16 matrix representation because right, you got your x dot, uh, so there's a, and then there's a c for c1, c2, c3, c1, c2, c3, b1, b2, b3, right? So you have a 16 matrix representation here of this G. Right, because you have a channel which is going to the uncertainty, which is p, you have a channel going to the controller, which is Y, and you have a channel for your, your regulated outputs. Uh, so you have three separate channels for output, and of course you have a X, your X dot equation there in the middle. 
And uh, of course, three inputs. You got the input from the uncertainty, input from the controller, and exogenous input. So three input channels, three output channels, and your uh, state, state, uh, state dynamics. Right? So the uh, the problem, of course, is to uh, is optimal is H infinity optimal control. You're finding the controller, right, uh, which minimizes this H infinity norm. Uh, under all uncertainties in the uh, given uncertainty set, right? So what does that mean? Well, that means uh, you're, you, you mat, you're finding the largest disturbance or most effective disturbance, if you will, uh, and that lies in this, right, feedback, right? So you, you close the loop on delta first, right? And that actually gives you <clears throat> this system, Right, so that's this system right here, and I should probably vary my colors. Right, so I'll block that out. Right, uh, sorry, my highlighter is not uh, not sufficiently narrow. Can I make my highlighter smaller? Make my highlighter smaller there. Right. So we uh, so this uh, lower star product is uh, uh, actually hold on. Closes it there. Well, so it closes it there, and then you get a two input, two output uh, thing right there, ignoring your k. And then you close the loop on uh, on k, and you get the lower star product, right? So that's this whole thing right there. So this goes to here. So this box goes to here, and this larger box here goes to the lower star product. So you close the upper loop first, and then you close the lower loop, and your uh, optimization problem is to um, minimize the uh, H infinity norm of that larger uh, loop, right? So you do these inputs one at a time. Uh, so how do, you, uh, how do you do that, right? Well, honestly, uh, you don't, right? It's like, it's hard, right? Um, there's no uh, way of doing it efficiently, right, because this, this is an LMI um, in delta, and then uh, you, you, assuming you've solved that LMI, right, and th there's no closed form solution for this, loop, this loop, no closed loop form solution, right, so you can't get an analytic expression for this, so you can't, if you can't, don't have an analytic expression for this term, right, you can't actually form this lower star product uh, with respect to K and then of course optimize it, right? So that's a problem, right? Uh, so how are we going to solve that? Basically, you, uh, we, we sort of, we take a sort of a, a duality based approach, right? We alternate uh, these loops, right? So um, what we do, this is DK iteration, right? So basically uh, we solve for a fixed um, uh, we we uh, we first uh, we reverse these soup over delta and inf over k, right? So first, uh, say we uh, for starting initialize some delta. Uh, we uh, we saw for given delta we solve the k, and then we for that given k we solve for the delta, right? And then we. Uh, re, um, iterate here and give me more space here. So for a given inf over k, right, then for that k, right, we soup over our deltas, and then uh, for that uh, that soup, right, we got have a, we inf over k again, and then for that k, we soup over delta again, and that for that delta, we inf over k again. And for that, you get the, the idea, right? So it's a, a sequence of optimization problems, right? At every given step, right, uh, the, we have a, a, an expression here for this, right? Um, but because we fixed it, we fixed delta. We fixed delta, solve for k. We fixed k, solve for delta. So at every step, right, this is a well-formed optimization problem. However, of course, we have no guarantee that this sequence of optimization problems is going to converge to the solution to what we actually want, 
which is this optimization problem. Yeah. Any, but uh, anyway, that uh, so that's that approach generally is is referred to as DK iteration. Uh, so D for the diagonal multiplier. And then K for the controller, right? Inf K soup delta. Well, actually, I should say our variable is not really delta; it's the scaling there. So we uh, we're, we're actually uh, souping over theta. Inf K soup theta, right? So okay. Um, that said, it seems like a relatively straightforward, but there are variations on this, and I'll try and explain why. Um, so let's let's examine this, right? So obviously, if you set theta equal to identity, uh, then if you ignore the upper channel, right? If you ignore the upper channel and just search for, if you ignore the uncertainty channel, uh, you're just solving a standard uh, optimal control problem with a b with a four matrix representation. Right. So, okay, and then given a controller, right, well, given a controller, you can actually, you can close this loop, right, and you can, uh, um, you get a four matrix representation for a given K, right, so you close this loop in these uh, C plus D one, two K and so forth, right, you get a closed loop, these become closed loop, closed loop, and you, uh, so given that K, you perform a uh, robustness analysis, basically. You find the uh, structured singular value for the system. So you find the, 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 the scaling, which gives you the best um, structured singular value. So first, first solve the optimal control problem, then close the loop. Step two, close the loop. And here's where the, the you get a bit tricky, right? Um, so, well, actually, the next step is actually more tricky. So, um, fix stack, find a, a gamma such that, so find a scaling associated with that, um, which corresponds to the, uh, say, the best scaling for that uh, particular controller, right? So, Okay, so you said you solve this uh, this closed loop optimization problem. Okay, that's great. Um, you can do this right. Uh, it's uh, you can do a variable substitution on gamma actually, uh, um, but uh, 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 note that here we've got um, gamma here and theta here. Uh, so that's actually a bilinear in, in gamma and theta. But right, you can do bisection on on gamma and it's just formulated as a sequence of optimization problems on theta. That's not actually how MATLAB does it, they, because bisection is slow, but uh, it, it's, it's the most obvious step. Um, and then uh, the, this now becomes a little bit tricky, and there's so many variations on DK iteration, uh, because if you just, so if you want, so given now that you're done with this, right, and you go back here, uh, and so you're, you're solving theta here. So if you if you now just solve this optimal control problem, so if you just solve it, you ignore the channel, right? If you're just finding the map from exogenous input here, and do, 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 that's delta. Right. W, Z, P, Q, Y, U. Right, so if you're just looking, if you're for the map from W to Z, which is actually what you're trying to do, right? What you're trying to solve, um, then theta actually doesn't come into that problem, right? So if you just consider like this step, right? This step right here uh, as solving this optimal control problem. Well, theta actually doesn't factor into this um, equation. So if you just drop this loop, it, uh, it doesn't factor in. So actually, when you're solving this problem here, right, uh, you actually want to minimize the um, 
the loop not just from exogenous input uh, to regulated output, but also from Q to P as well uh, for that given uh, theta, right? So then theta comes into it, right? So then you've got this larger uh, G structure here, um, which of course is not really what you're trying to do in optimal control. You're not trying to minimize the structured singular value and the bound from W to Z. Uh, so at this point, it's a little bit heuristic, um, but it does allow you to simultaneously sort of maximize uh, this map uh, while also sort of maximizing or minimizing the, um, the structured singular value at the same time. So here we've got, right, uh, so this minimizes W to Z and uh, and uh, Q to P, right? So uh, that's the H infinity bound, and this is a structured singular value bound, right? So sort of two H infinity bounds, and that's somewhat heuristic, right? Notice, uh, by the way, uh, also, right, for, for your, your theta, right, that you got here, right, you have to take the square root of it, because this is actually not the scaling, right? This is the square of the scaling, so you actually have to take this, the square root of that scaling to get the actual scaling. Right. So in this case, right, you're uh, using theta here, theta one half, and theta negative one half here, right? Uh, so you're you're minimizing both of these maps here, right? Uh, you're closing both of those loops. Um, which is a bit, again, it's, it's a bit heuristic. Uh, and then, of course, when you come back here and you, you're solving the, the, uh, the, uh, the theta problem, right, so for fixed theta k, uh, well, then, I don't know, what, are you, what do you want to do the scaling on? Um, so actually, what I suggest here, there's two options, right? You can actually find your theta for the given controller, or you can actually... Um, you can do this. You can actually uh, find the, uh, you, so if we uh, get rid of the, this thing here. Uh, so when you're solving the other optimal control, uh, so for a given K, uh, you can solve for uh, this problem here, right? So you can do this sort of state feedback uh, H infinity gain question there uh, for, the, for the closed loop for both of these, these maps. Anyway, uh, you know, that's decay iteration. It does it work well? Sometimes, not always. Uh, there are various variations on it, right? Uh, so actually the MATLAB version actually, uh, when they're doing this part, I believe, they're, uh, they're actually doing the mu synthesis case. Um, no, the, sorry, the, when they're doing this part, they're doing actually mu synthesis. So they're combining optimal control and mu synthesis there. So they're ma minimizing the, uh, the structured singular value for that controller, and they're minimizing the um, uh, the, uh, uh, the the H infinity map as well. Uh, in any case, uh, it's an iteration. It's heuristic. Uh, it works sometimes, but not others. Uh, and there are several variations on on the formulation of the problem. But it's uh, it's the only way. We, that we know of uh, to solve this, uh, at least in an approximate sense, this dynamic output feedback problem. Right. So there is a way. I don't think I ask you to do it in the homework uh, because it's it's kind of somewhat it, it doesn't doesn't often work very well. Right. Okay. So so to conclude, right, um, a couple of comments. Uh, so first of all. Uh, the uh, the version we uh, of decay iteration we used in this lecture was for dynamic uncertainties, right? Ones which are vary with time. If it doesn't vary with time, if it's static uncertainty, uh, then the scalings that we proposed are conservative because all our scalings are time invariant, and so that they commute no matter what what the time is. In the case where uh, this, uh, the uncertainty here is static, right, it doesn't change with time, uh, then you can actually 
uh, use transfer functions here as your scalings, right? So t uh, of s, right? And t inverse of s, right? Uh, however, of course, right, that introduces all sorts of like complexity and parameterization of transfer functions and stuff into the problem. And hence, we, we don't deal with it because it's just too, things are getting too complicated. And, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, it seems like uh, the time-varying uncertainty case is, uh, is more helpful uh, than the static one. But that's, that's what it is. Much, uh, much harder problem, right? Parameterizing those transfer functions. Um, and again, I guess I, I refer to the uh, the literature. Uh, I think Pat, the D Doyle, uh, Zhao, and Glover book has a uh, has some work on that. Um, so to conclude, right, what we've done is we've looked at the problem of robustness. To we've parameterized a set several sets of uh, sources of uncertainty, uh, parametric, um, poly, so parametric and under parametric we had polytopic and interval. Uh, we had uh, the L in the LFT framework, we had uh, dynamic, static, structured, unstructured, Uh, we had the case of uh, dynamic uncertainty with non-parametric, uh, which was actually quite easy because it's equivalent to the uh, small gain condition in most cases. Um, and I, I hate to say it, but this is just really the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, types of uncertainties that we can consider. Um, Although it's it's definitely the highlights, the, the, we've we've covered the highlights of, of robust control. These uh, I think the, probably the the cases we covered are approximately ninety percent maybe of uh, of the the sort of useful literature uh, on robust control. All uh, the problem with robust control is that uh, so many of the problems really um, are uh, intractable, are NP hard. Uh, for example, dynamic output feedback is NP hard, right? And so we just we 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 have no good LMI condition for it because there is none, right? Um, as we see, as we'll see in the the next set of lectures, when we consider the uh, the use of sum of squares and uh, sort of more polynomial optimization techniques, uh, we can get around this, uh, this uh, or we can at least approach this NP-hardness uh, in a sort of rational way. All right. Um, but before we do that, right, I, I guess we can conclude that in this, up till lecture 14, we've essentially gone through all of the problems that are not NP-hard that we can solve in uh, using LMIs. Right, so in, a, in, in some ways this is like a logical conclusion to the course and if you don't want to if, if you don't have an NP hard problem, uh, you could probably stop here at lecture 14. Because uh, when we get into the, into the next set of lectures, we're going to be considering NP hard problems. So nonlinear systems, uh, the structured singular value, which is an NP hard problem, uh, other forms of parametric non additive uncertainties, um, all of which are NP hard. And so what we're going to be looking for in the next set of lectures is a sort of a way of handling NP hardness, uh, sort of um, approaching conservativity, because any LMI, any algorithm we propose is going to have to be conservative for 
um, uh, that problem. So all algorithms that we propose henceforth will be conservative in a certain sense. And what we're going to be focusing mostly on is a way of managing that conservatism. So we'll give not a, an LMI which is necessary and sufficient, but a sequence of LMIs, which each of which is conservative, but becomes significant as we increase the size of the LMI, get less so. Right? So a sequence of LMIs of, of increasing complexity and uh, decreasing conservatism or increasing accuracy. But uh, I'm getting ahead of myself to some extent. Uh, at this point, I will close out lecture 14 and uh, bid you adieu uh, to rejoin you in lecture 15 where we'll consider all these NP hard problems and propose LMI approaches uh, for solving them.